Good morning, and thank you for joining us for the worship service with the South Baton Rouge Church of Christ. Uh, today we're going to worship in song, we're going to sing, we're going to take communion together, and then I'm going to have a message to share with you from the book of Jonah. Uh, I know we're spread all apart, but these worship times are meant to bring us together, to, to unite us in thought and in worship and so I hope that even if you're on your couch or at your table, that you'll imagine in some way that as we experience this, we're all together. Uh, I want to draw your attention to a couple things. One is a, a link below for contribution. Uh, if you're able, please um, follow that link. It will give you instructions on how you can contribute to the, to the work of this congregation. And also there's a, a link there for prayer requests. Please fill out the form if you've got anything going on in your life. It is a great honor and a privilege for us to pray for you. As we move into our time of worship, let's pray. Our Father, we thank you for loving us. Um, we thank you for being with us and for every step that we take, um, guiding us and protecting us. And as strange as this year has been, we're reminded that you are always with us and you've brought us this far. Lord, I pray that you help us to continue to look to you and to trust you. And Lord, as we uh, worship today, help us to set our minds on you and to push away thoughts and, and uh, things that are going to distract us and pull us away uh, and just be fully present in our time of worship. We thank you for Jesus who gives us life and we pray that we will be your people who share that life with others. And it's in his name we pray. Amen. Let's worship. Search the world, but it couldn't fill me. And man's empty praise are treasures that fade and never enough. Then you came along and put me back together, and every desire. Is now satisfied hearing your love. Oh, there's nothing better than you. There's nothing better than you, Lord. There's nothing, and nothing is better than you. Show you my weakness, my failures and flaws. Lord, you've seen them all, and you still call me friend. Because the God of the mountain is the God of the valley. And there's not a place your mercy and grace won't find me again. Turn bones 
turn seas into highways. You're the only one who can. You're the only one who can. Lord, there's nothing better than you. Lord, there's nothing better than you. Lord, there's nothing. And nothing is better than you. Oh, there's nothing better than you. There's nothing better than you, Lord. There's nothing. And nothing is better than you. You turn graves into gardens. You turn bones into armies. You turn seas into highways. You're the only one who can. You turn graves into gardens. You turn bones into armies. You turn seas into highways. You're the And nothing is better than you. Oh, there's nothing better than you, Lord. There's nothing better than you, Lord. There's nothing. And nothing is better than you. and 
How's everybody doing? Is anybody ready for COVID-19 to be over and done with? I know I am. It's funny, when this first started, I had the strong feeling of, we got this. But as the months have slowly gone by, my strength has diminished, my rah-rah attitude has fizzled, and my sidewalk chalk has been put away. The virus has worn me down and revealed things about me that I didn't even know were there. Last spring, I received a poem that means a lot more to me now than it did back then. The name of the poem is Exposed and it's by a woman named Sarah Burns and I wanted to read it to you. We've all been exposed, not necessarily to the virus, though maybe, who knows. We've all been exposed by the virus. Corona is exposing us, exposing our weak sides, our dark sides, exposing what normally lies far beneath the surface of our souls. Hidden by the invisible mask we wear, now exposed by the paper mask we can't hide far enough behind. Corona is exposing our addiction to comfort, our obsession with control, our compulsion to hoard, our protection of self. Corona is peeling back our layers, tearing down our walls, revealing our illusions and leveling our best laid plans. Corona is exposing the gods we worship, our health, our hurry, our sense of security, our favorite lies, our secret lust, our misplaced trust. Corona is calling everything into question what is the church without a building? What is my worth without an income? How do we plan without certainty? How do we love despite risk? Corona is exposing me, my mindless numbing, my endless scrolling, my careless words and my fra fragile nerves. We've all been exposed, our junk laid bare, our fears made known, the band-aid torn, the masquerade done. So what now, what's left? Clean hands, clear eyes, tender hearts. What Corona reveals, God can heal. I think it's appropriate, maybe even symbolic, that to take this communion today, we have to remove our mask. Hopefully as you listen to this poem, you realize that we wear other masks as well. We mask our sins, our selfish attitudes, our fears, and our pride. But let's be real, God knows everything about us and he still loves us. Satan is the one who convinces us that we need to wear masks around each other. Satan wants to make us feel guilty for being imperfect. And it's true, we are imperfect. 
but because of the body and blood of Jesus Christ that we celebrate in communion right now, we are now perfectly imperfect. So let's go ahead and take off all of our masks and come before God with humble hearts and then reach out to one another with love and respect. We all need help, especially during these times of isolation. Uh, we're going to take communion now and uh, I'm going to start us in a prayer and then give us a few uh, seconds to think about how we've been personally exposed by, uh, through this pandemic and uh, the resulting uh, changes that have happened in, in us or to us in this year. So let's pray. Father, uh, we know that uh, you love us and that all of us um, have come to you with open hearts. And uh, Father, we want to lay before you how this uh, uh, pandemic has exposed parts of us that we want to turn over to you. And uh, we're going to have a few minutes of prayer where each one of us can think about that. Father, we thank you that you accept us and love us unconditionally. And as we take of this bread and this uh, fruit of the vine, we remember Jesus' death, his body, his sacrifice, his blood shed for us, uh, for the forgiveness of our sins. And we're especially thankful that uh, we're, we're children of yours. Help us to be faithful to you and we pray that we can turn over the parts of our lives that uh, we're still hanging on to completely to you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Death was around. 
darkness rejoiced as though heaven was lost. Then Jesus arose with our freedom in hand. That's when death was arrested in my life began. Oh, your grace so free washes over. So today we're going to complete our journey through the book of Jonah. Uh, last week we were in, we began chapter four and listened to how God pursued Jonah. Even after everything Jonah had done, even after Jonah still wasn't getting it, it really mattered that Jonah aligned himself with God, that Jonah's heart beat in rhythm with God's heart. Uh, and today we're going to look at what is that message that God wanted him to get? Right? What is this message that is being sent through this final part of the book of Jonah? 
Uh, as before we <clears throat> get to the text, I, I want to share uh, a story with you uh, from one of my favorite storytellers. Uh, a man named Bob Goff is a lawyer in the in the L.A. area. He uh, actually works as an adjunct professor at Pepperdine, uh, off and on. Um, but he is he has an incredible way of seeing the world with joy and wonder and living out his faith in as real and as joyful ways as possible. And he has some great stories. So he has a couple books. One is love does, and the other is uh, this one, Everybody Always, uh, which is this experience that I'm going to share with you. Um, most of them are, are about what it looks like to live in abundance and to live with an open heart and to love people freely. Uh, and some of them uh, are a little more challenging. Um, this one here is a very is a very sober and heavy situation that he encountered uh, in the midst of following Jesus. So uh, through a series of events that are also a story of their own, he became connected with the government of Uganda. And he started going down to Uganda to help. And he's, he's a lawyer, and so he's looking for ways that he could help through his professional abilities. And uh, he connected with one of the country top judges. And through some discussions with this judge, he discovered that this country of Uganda had a terrible problem with witch doctors and child sacrifice. So um, what had what had happened, what, would, what was happening was that there were about a thousand children every year that were being abducted by witch doctors. Uh, it's a terrible number. And, and the reason was is that these um, witch doctors believed that body parts often carried special powers. So they would kidnap children, take these parts and bury them in the foundation of buildings or use them for ceremonies and, and all kinds of terrible things that we don't really want to talk about. Um, but in fact, sometimes mothers would pierce the ears of their newborn daughters in hopes to make their child look like less of a perfect sacrifice so they wouldn't be kidnapped. Now, as unbelievable and terrible as that is, none of these witch doctors, none had been prosecuted. Now, there are a couple of reasons for this. The first one is that the victims uh, almost never survived. But more than that, people were afraid. They were afraid of, of these witch doctors, what they would do, what power they might have. And it, that, that fear spanned to judges and court systems and court officials. And so these witch doctors were never tried and convicted for their crimes. And so Bob Goff said to this judge, if we can find a case, will you try it? And the judge said that he would. Now, it, um, it wasn't long um, before a case appeared. Um, there was a witch doctor uh, by the name of Kabi, who was the lead witch doctor in an area of northern Uganda. And kid, uh, Kabi, one day, kidnapped uh, an eight-year-old boy on the way home from school, um, took parts of his body, and then left him in a bush to die. Now, miraculously and, and gratefully, the boy survived. And he lived, and he returned home, and he, he told the authorities what had happened. And uh, he looked, went through a lineup and identified Kabi as the one who had, uh, who had kidnapped him. And so Bob Goff and this, and this other judge, they realized they finally have a case. They have a, a survivor from one of these crimes, and they also have a leading witch doctor. And if they can prosecute this guy, they can send a message to all the other witch doctors that this will not be tolerated. So Kabi is, is a, arrested. A judge is willing to conduct a trial. It was the first of its kind, as I said before, and um, that scared the witch doctors. They, they fought back. Uh, they showed up at all hours of the night at the judge's house and did a lot of creepy things and were very, you know, witch doctor scary. Uh, even though he had, this, this judge had armed guards, it, it still didn't slow down the, the presence of evil that was fighting back. But when the trial came, when the day to finally put this at the end, um, the case was laid out, all the evidence was put before uh, the court, and this young boy came to the stand. 
And he came to the stand and he stood up and he pointed at Kabi and he said, that's the man who tried to kill me. Then in, full, in front of a room full of onwork, onlookers, in, a court, in court proceedings that were being taped and hopefully would be shared throughout the country to send a message, this young boy bravely told about the terrible things that had happened to him. Eventually, the ruling comes back and Kabi is found guilty. And they send a message throughout the country that evil would no longer be tolerated. Justice had come where there was great evil. Now, as, we, as the story of Jonah begins, Jonah is sent to a city of great evil. Now, I, we, we sometimes look at all the story about Jonah himself and what happens and him running and him coming back and, and look mostly at the interaction between Jonah and God. But let's not forget that the reason that God sends Jonah to Nineveh is because he is very upset with the Ninevites. In fact, he's sending Jonah to warn them that destruction is coming. God is mad at their behavior and ready to wipe them out. And as we know, Jonah runs, God finds him and puts him in a fish and brings him back. Jonah relents and says, I'm going to go. He goes to Nineveh. And while he's there, he preaches the message. And miraculously, the Ninevites repent, beg God forgiveness, and begin to, to change their ways. And it says that God relents from sending his wrath. Now, Jonah, though is not real happy with that income, uh, outcome. And that brings us here to Jonah chapter four. Starting one, it says, but to Jonah, this seemed very wrong and he became angry. He prayed to the Lord, isn't this what I said, Lord, when I was still at home? That is what I tried to forestall by fleeing to Sharshish. I knew that you're gracious and compassionate God, slow to anger and abounding in love, a God who relents from sending calamity. Now, Lord, take away my life for it is better for me to die than to live. But the Lord said, is it right for you to be angry? And Jonah had gone out and sat down at a place east of the city. And there he made himself a shelter and sat in its shade and waited to see what would happen to the city. Then the Lord God provided a leafy plant and made it grow up over Jonah to give shade for his head to ease his discomfort. <clears throat> and Jonah was very happy about the plant. But at dawn the next day, God provided a worm, which chewed the plant so that it withered. And when the sun rose, God provided a scorching east wind, and the sun blazed on Jonah's head so that he grew faint. He wanted to die, and he said, it would be better for me to die than to live. But God said to Jonah, is it right for you to be angry about the plant? It is, he said, and I'm so angry, I wish I were dead. But the Lord said, you've been concerned about this plant, though you did not tend to it or make it grow. It sprang up overnight and it died overnight. And should I not have concern for the great city of Nineveh, in which there are more than 120,000 people who cannot tell their right hand from their left and also many animals? And the book of Jonah then ends with that cliffhanger, this question from God. So at the beginning of this chapter, Jonah says, yes, I'm mad that these people repented and you didn't send your punishment. And Jonah has good reason for wanting the Assyrians to be destroyed. All right, the, the, the Assyrians were, were trouble. In the, in the VeggieTale version, uh, it says that they were bad. They, they stole and they lied and then they would hit other people with fishes. The real Assyrians were much scarier. They were brutal. They were known in the ancient world for their, their cruelty and their brutality. Uh, there was one king that was known for cutting off the lips and hands of his enemies, another that flayed his victims alive and made piles out of skulls. These are not uh, cartoon characters, right? These don't go naturally on a, a children's flannel graph. These are evil, brutal people. Now, uh, also to be noted is these events take place uh, likely around 750 BC, which 
uh, is a time that Jews who would lead, read about this later uh, would note very carefully because in 722 BC, the Assyrians, where Nineveh is, serves as the capital, these, these same Assyrians, about 25 years later, are going to attack and defeat the northern, uh, the northern portion of Israel, the, uh, the northern kingdom. So it says here in 2 Kings chapter 17 and verse 6, it says, In the ninth year of Hosea, the king of Assyria captured Samaria and deported the Israelites to Assyria. He settled them in Halah, in Gozen, on the Habor River, and in the towns of the Medes. So it, it, it tells you here in 722, not very much long, not, not much longer after Jonah's a message to them after their repentance, it evidently didn't stick. And they come in and attack the Israelites in brutal ways. And uh, it describes kind of what the Assyrians would do because they would uh, could defeat people and take those people out of their land and put them somewhere else and bring other defeated nations and put them in that land. And, and in that way, they mixed up the populations so that they weren't as equipped to rebel and fight back. It's through this that the 10 tribes in the northern kingdom uh, virtually lose their identity, right? They, they lose their identities as, uh, for the most part, of, of who they are as, as tribesmen uh, and what, what tribe they're connected with. Only the southern kingdom um, uh, remains with a, a clear sense of, of their heritage. So <laughs> this... Um, this book, the book of Jonah, is, is uh, obviously written much later than the events that happen. And as it's passed on to readers, it is likely that they know the rest of the story. That they know what happened to Nineveh and the Assyrians. And even though their hearts changed on that day, that they come back and do great harm to Israel. So as they're reading about this country, they, they would most likely identify with Jonah in his heart. So let, let's not sugarcoat what God is asking of Jonah, because God is asking the oppressed to go speak to the oppressor, right? Assyria was already mounting its forces. It was growing in strength. They were already causing trouble for the Israelites. Uh, God is sending the weaker of the countries to speak to the stronger. He's sending one man to speak to an entire group. It would be like sending a black man to a Klan rally to speak a message of destruction. It would be like sending a Jewish man in the 1930s Germany to go speak to the Nazi party. These are dangerous things spoken to evil and cruel people. These are Israel's enemies. But as we discussed last week, God wanted Jonah's heart to beat in rhythm with his own. He doesn't just want Jonah to go to the Ninevites, give a message and leave. He deeply cares for these people as lost and broken who need to know him as their father. And he needs for Jonah to see them that way. So it illustrates it this way in the, in the chapter. The Jonah's sitting, he's waiting. We don't know why he's waiting. It's possible he has nowhere else to go. He's afraid to go home and say, I just saved the Assyrians. So he's waiting and maybe hoping against hope that God still sends his destruction. And so he watches the city. And while he's doing that, God has this plant that grows up over him. And it gives him shade and he really likes it. And Jonah's very happy. It's the first time that we've seen Jonah happy in the whole book. Well, then the plant dies, worm eats it, and then a scorching east wind comes and the sun, sun bakes down on him. And Jonah is mad and in pain and in misery so much that he says he would like to die. And then God speaks to Jonah and he makes a connection, comparison. He's like, Jonah, you care about this plant. You didn't, you didn't do anything for it. It just, it just grew up. You didn't make it grow. You don't have a, a personal relationship with this plant. He, Jonah only knew the plant for like a day. God says, what about these people? Right, Jonah, people are way more important than, than a, a weed, right? 
So what about these people, these 120,000 people who are lost? He says they don't know their right from their left. Even in the midst of their brutality and violence, God saw them as lost children. Now, this isn't to ignore their evil, the presence of, of the evil in their place or the presence of evil other places. Um, it's not to ignore a call to justice and making things right. It's not a dismissal of wrong. Remember, this book, like I said before, starts off with God sending Jonah with a message of destruction because God had seen what the Ninevites were doing and was so upset by what he saw that he said, I've got to destroy him. But he's also their father. And he loves them and he longs for them to change. And so he sends Jonah with a message in the hopes that they would. I think, I think this is why, in that, that, that part of God's heart, I think this is why Jesus says to love your enemies. He says it a couple times in the Sermon on the Mount in Matthew chapter 5. He says, you've heard it said, love your neighbor and hate your enemy. That's the way the world sees it, as most people understand it. He says, but I'm going to tell you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. In Luke chapter 6, he says, but love your enemies, do good to them, and lend to them without expecting to get anything back. Then your reward will be great and you will be children of the Most High because he is kind to the ungrateful and the wicked. Now, these are not just teachings of Jesus. They're not lofty ambitions that we hope that we could come to. Jesus wasn't just setting a scale that he knew could never be reached because Jesus himself, when he was on the cross, being tortured by his oppressors, he prayed that God would forgive them. In Jonah chapter 3, before what we, what we read, when, when Nineveh repents and turns their hearts to God, that would be a great Hollywood ending, right? Jonah runs with the, from giving this message, but he finally does, and it didn't seem like they would accept it, and they did, and that's great, the end, credits roll. But that's, that's a Hollywood ending, not a God ending. God endings are when everyone is made whole. And God's ending was that heart, Jonah's heart is also made whole. So the story I began with about the justice served in the, to the Ugandan witch doctors is a great Hollywood ending, right? Children are made safer. Evil is punished. But there were still brokenness and hearts that needed to be made whole. So Bob Goff says, as much as I, he, had, he had built a great relationship and friendship with this, this young boy, he'd even give, gotten him some, some medical help that, that was going to help to physically restore him quite a bit in the United States. Uh, and so he spent a lot of time with, with this young boy, but he still didn't feel right because that witch doctor, Kabi, was on his heart. And he, he says this, he says, no doubt, Kabi was my enemy but he was also my chance to become more like Jesus. And so Bob Goff went to visit him in prison. And shockingly, this witch doctor comes out to meet him and gets down on a knee and begins saying how sorry he was. Now, of course, Bob Goff is very skeptical of this. Uh, here's a man finally in prison who's, who's trying to get something out of, of saying he's sorry for his crimes. But um, he continues the conversation anyway. And, this, and they sit down and they start talking and the witch doctor tells him about his life and growing up as the son of a witch doctor and the terrible things that witchcraft had done to him. And he says this, and it shocked him. The witch doctor says, I'm going to die here, but what I really need is forgiveness. <laughs> now, Bob says, absolutely not. He didn't say it, but he's thinking, absolutely not. I, he, after all that had been done to an eight-year-old boy, are you kidding me? You, you, you even think that it's possible that you could be forgiven, that you even think to deserve it? 
But Bob was reminded of Jesus. And he began looking at Kabi with new eyes. They began to talk about their families and what was important. And Bob told Kabi about Jesus. And he, as he hears about this Jesus who gives new life and forgiveness, Kabi wanted to follow Jesus. And he decides to give his life and put his faith in Jesus. Later, Bob discovers that, that this whole prison, it's about 300 men that are, that are all doomed to die. You know, Kabi had received a death sentence. But this place is full of people like him, and none of them had heard about Jesus. And so Bob asked the prison officials, can I tell them about Jesus? And he's told no, but they gave permission for Kabi to tell them. And so he does it. Kabi gets up and he comes out of his, out of his cell and in front, they, they call the people out and, and he begins telling them about Jesus. And he preaches the love and forgiveness that come through him. And hundreds decide to be baptized that day. And so they, they baptize all of these men. And when he's done, Kabi locks eyes with Bob and he walks over to, them, to him with great intention and he looks Bob in the eye and he says, I forgive you. Now, Bob is, is kind of confused by this, right? I'm the good guy in this story. You're the wrongdoer. Why are you forgiving me? But it occurred to him. He realized that in this whole story, from, from Cobby's point of view, Bob was the enemy. And even as he was understanding how, how wrong he had been, how, how much Cobby had done wrong, he still saw Bob as an enemy. And if he was going to fully embrace the heart of Jesus, it meant that he too had to forgive. As Bob had been Cobby's enemy, he was now his friend. What happens through Kabi's life in the prison is beautiful, but it went way beyond that because that work and, and that relationship have led to, to opportunities for, for reaching more witch doctors and getting them out of, of their trades and the terrible things that they were doing and helping teach and, and equip them for, for other work and other jobs all throughout the country. You see, God's stories only end when everyone is made whole. You know, God's not frustrated that Jonah is upset by the Ninevites. He's upset with, with the Ninevites, right? But he's upset through chapter 4 because Jonah's heart does not long for them to be made whole. Jonah wants the Hollywood ending. He's not looking for the God ending. And God wanted Jonah to see what he sees. Right, he says, he says, look at, shouldn't I care about this 120,000 people who don't know their right from their left? He wanted Jonah to see with compassionate and loving eyes the way that he sees. And God wants us to see what he sees. I don't think I've, I've ever seen a time where our communities and our, our culture was more openly divided. And, and we're, we're kind of, especially in, in the midst of, a, of, a, of an election season, pulled into polarizing categories. Almost everything that you can have an opinion on belongs to one camp or another. Now, I, I'm not saying those things don't matter. I, I'm not being dismissive of every one of those issues. In fact, many of those issues, not all of them, but many of those issues are, are deeply important and should matter. But when we approach them in this polarizing way, we begin to grab those who are our friends and point out those who are enemies. But how should we see our enemies? See, when God looks down on the earth, when God looks down on our, on our city and our nation, he doesn't see young and old people. He doesn't see red or blue people. He doesn't see elephants and donkeys. He doesn't see black or white people. He doesn't see masked or unmasked standing or kneeling. He sees his children. And he wants each of us to see the people around us as his children. 
He wants us to be moved in compassion, that even those who are deeply wrong, even those who have done terrible things. And look, we, this is a hard teaching, right? Forgiving your enemies and loving them, forgiving witch doctors that mutilate children and Assyrians that destroy nations, that's hard stuff. If somebody were to walk away from being a Christian because they got that message, I would get it, right? I think people walk away from Christianity for a, for a lot lesser things. But to understand that message fully is very, very hard. But if we're going to follow Jesus, we need to be willing to look directly at it and not look away and say, in our hearts, can we love like you do? Can we look at those who we believe to be wrong, that we believe to be lost and sinful, and can we approach them with love and compassion? Listen, there are practical ways to, to apply this that are going to be right in front of you. You're going to be involved in many conversations, especially over the next few months, where you're going to be pulled to, to fight on one topic or another. But make sure, as a follower of Jesus, as a child of God, as someone who has learned from Jonah and who has learned from Jesus, that when you respond, your responses should be woven with a great love. That, that those are God's children and you should treat them accordingly. Listen, this is our opportunity to change the world. Everyone expects people to fight, to grab their position, to hold it down. And they expect that Christians will have strong opinions and, and we should have great strong convictions. But how we communicate those things and how we treat to them, how we treat people will show the world what we believe about God, what we believe about forgiveness, how willing we are to follow our Jesus that on the cross says, forgive them, they don't know what they're doing. The invitation is when everyone else sees enemies, we see instruments of God's mercy and grace. Let's pray. God, in the midst of our broken world, give us your eyes. Help our hearts to beat in rhythm with your own. And help us even as we try to, to claim you and follow you and, and, and teach others the, the, the best way to see the world and life that we speak to them in ways that show them who you are. Even if they can't be convinced by our arguments about the way things should be done, that they will see the the spirit in which we approach them and know that we deeply embody your love. Oh God, we thank you for loving us. We thank you, each of us, just as Jonah received your mercy and compassion, we too have each received your mercy and compassion. May that mercy pour out of us back into the world. Uh, thank you for Jesus who gives us life and who gives us hope. And it's in his name we pray. Amen. One of the greatest blessings that we enjoy as Christians is our adoption as children of God. We live in his constant loving care and we know him as our loving Heavenly Father. But there's another great blessing that goes along with this. Because we are children, we are also heirs of God. And we have a great inheritance stored up for us in the future. There's much about this inheritance that we do not know. But we do get glimpses in the book of Revelation of what will be involved in this inheritance. And I want to share with you today one of those glimpses from the book of Revelation. Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, and the sea was no more. And I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Behold, the dwelling place of God is with man. And he will dwell with them, and they will be his people, 
and God himself will be with them as their God. He will wipe away every tear from their eyes, and death shall be no more. Neither shall there be mourning, nor crying, nor pain anymore. For the former things have passed away. And he who was on the throne said, Behold, I am making all things new.